It is September 10th, 2022, and you are listening to the Sabbath Teaching Service from Ephraim's Light Assembly. My name is Doris Smith, the pastor's wife and his assistant. The portion of scripture that we are going to cover today is Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1, to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 8. The title of this Torah portion is Kitavo, and in Hebrew it means when you come. We recommend that in order to better comprehend the lessons contained in this portion of Scripture, that you read Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1, to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 8, before listening to this teaching. And now, with 29 years of pastoral experience, evangelism, leading prayer and deliverance teams, and biblical studies, here is Pastor Frank Smith, founder and senior pastor of Ephraim's Light Assembly, with today's teaching, Choices from a Mountain. I want to welcome all of you to this teaching. You know, every nation, like every individual, is different. Every nation that God has allowed on this earth has a story to tell, and it is their own unique story. There is no place on earth where there are more memorials to the past than in the United States of America. Lyndon Johnson, in his inaugural address, said a couple of things that are right here in the portion of Scripture that we study today. Lyndon Johnson said, For every nation there is a destiny. For some, history decides. For this generation, the choice must be our own. Later in the same address, he said this, If we fail now, we shall have forgotten in abundance what we learned in hardship, that democracy rests on faith, that freedom asks more than it gives, and that the judgment of God is harshest on those who are most favored. Yeshua said in Luke 12, verse 48, But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For every one to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. From our studies, we know that faith is trust in God. Faith is a covenant of trust wherein the weaker party in the covenant, that's us, agrees to be obedient to the stronger party in the covenant, that is God. In turn, the stronger party agrees to protect and strengthen the weaker party. It means we are to trust God as the engineer of our lives and the life of our country, and in turn we agree to follow his statutes and judgments because they are designed to prosper us and keep us safe. We all want to be safe. You know, America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles, a covenant nation wherein people from all ethnic groups came together to honor a moral bond an undertaking to be free to worship and honor God. Everybody came buying into the American story. Our first president, George Washington, and many others since then knew and stated that if America were to deviate from its God-given mission, it would not last. The mission? Be an unselfish, free, loving home for his people. So every memorial in America tells part of the story of this nation's quest for freedom and godly standards. As the nation matured, more immigrants came and took the nation's story, and they made it their own. Like Ruth, who was a Moabite, not a Jew, who became Jewish by saying, in Ruth 1 verse 16, But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you, For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. It's the same thing that Abraham did. He made God's story his own story in Genesis 15, verse 6. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. You'll also find that in Romans 4, verse 3, and Galatians 3, verse 6. 
Now, you see, America was founded on these principles, and our founding fathers made this covenant with the Lord. George Washington said, The perpetuous smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. Our scripture lesson for this week is a continuation of Moses' closing address to the Israelites before he was taken into the realm of God in the spirit world. Last week we studied Ki Tetse, which is when you go out against your enemies. It was about honoring our fellow man even though we are victor in war against him. This week we study Ki Tavo, Deuteronomy 26 verse 1. When you come to the land Adonai your God is giving you as your inheritance, take possession of it and settle there. In the first part of this study in Deuteronomy 26 verse 1 to Deuteronomy 26 verse 4, we see that the Israelites were to bring the first fruits from their crops to the temple for the purpose of keeping them from thinking they raised the fruit. Now first fruits is bikurim in Hebrew, derived from the root word bikor, meaning firstborn. First fruits is a type and shadow of firstborn, a glimpse of the Messiah. Colossians 1.15, He, the Messiah, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Ladies and gentlemen, Yeshua, being the firstborn of creation, also appears six other times in the Bible, including Revelation 1, verse 5. Exodus 34, 26. The first of the firstfruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. We need to be thankful always for God's provision for us. Our gifts and ties to God keep us from thinking that our money is ours. Everything we have belongs to God, and God has placed us as stewards of his wealth. Throughout this portion, as in other portions, we see that we are to be just like Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. They were placed in his garden and given charge over it. They were to enjoy it and prosper there. There was only one thing that God warned them about. Do not eat from the tree of good and evil. God only wanted mankind to know good things and not evil things. He wanted us to be like him, unselfish and loving. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve became selfish and changed that to what they could take for themselves. So the powerful theme of unselfishness will be present throughout this study. We work for God. The first moment after I had a Damascus Road experience with God years ago, those were his very words. You will be working for me from now on. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Yeshua for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Folks, we are in the high holy days that God set aside for our benefit in restoring ourselves in righteousness. He set up the Sabbath and the feast days for us to observe and follow as a path to righteousness, a path to a personal relationship with Him. These feast days are tied to the first fruit offerings that the Lord commanded to remind us that everything is his and that we are the stewards of his creation. So then let us examine these paths ordained by God for us. Passover is tied to the exodus and to the barley harvest. During the growing of the wheat, we are counting the Omar, which is counting down to the wheat harvest, which is always around May or June time frame. This is the time of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, also called Pentecost, and Yom Habikram. Before the destruction of the temple, it was the most significant and festive of the agriculture year. Now, after the destruction of the temple, it also began to commemorate the giving of the Ten Commandments and the Torah at Mount Sinai. So I want to call your attention to Deuteronomy 26, verse 1, where it says, 
when you have taken possession of the land because there's an anomaly here. It's the same phrase used in Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, but 17, 14 in the original Hebrew, the word for that phrase, which is wishrishta, W-I-R-I-S-T-A-H, meaning and possess it, has a letter missing in it. That letter is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Vav. Now, unlike our alphabet, every Hebrew word and every Hebrew letter within the word has a meaning. The Vav means a hook, a spear, or a tent peg. It's something to be used to connect or anchor something. So we know that six is the number of man, therefore man is missing from Deuteronomy 17, 14, letting us know that it is God and only God who gave them, who anchored the land of Israel, and it is teaching us that it is God who has provided all that we have in this life. Also, this is God's way to let the Israelites know that if they do not obey and go chasing after other gods, they can be removed from the land. So this portion of scripture takes place in about 1404 B.C. And yes, in 721 B.C., God did scatter the Israelites from the land because of disobedience. The land is Haaretz in Hebrew. So seeing these feast days from an agricultural point of view, we have to realize that Shavuot, Pentecost, all the way up to Sukkot, at the end of the fall feats, people would bring their first fruits to the temple as an offering satisfying the commandment of the Lord. When they saw the first bloom on the plant, they would tie a ribbon around the branch with the bloom on it so they would know which was the first fruit when they began the harvest. For those living too far away to make the trip for every harvest, they could put the first fruits of each harvest, barley, figs, pomegranates, olives, grapes, date, and wheat in a basket. They would dehydrate or dry them and layer leaves between the different harvests to keep them arranged nicely and not be mixed together until they could make that pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. After the Israelites were given the promised land by God, they would travel together in community groups to Jerusalem where God chose to put his name 2 Chronicles 6, verse 6, Yet I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there. The new land, Israel, was a long land, and it would take them time to reach Jerusalem. They would sleep under the stars along the way and not in homes or inns for fear someone might have died there, and they would become to mean contaminated unclean, and not be able to go into the temple to present their offerings to the Lord. In the morning, they would rise and say, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the house of the Lord. And that's a quote that Isaiah would later use in Isaiah 2, verse 3. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. As they went along, they would put the ox to be sacrificed in front of the procession and on his horns place gold and olive leaves. They would sing along the way Psalm 122 verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. They would stop at the gates of the city and arrange the offering so that they were in order of the time of the harvest. Now the news of their coming would spread across the land, therefore they were greeted by the rabbis and the laborers. They would be singing Psalm 122 verse 2, Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. They would to Tehillim play and sing until they reached the temple mount. Along the way, they would sing Psalm 30, verse 2. O oh Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. You see, this was their way of thanking the Lord for a safe journey. God wants us to be thankful for every day that he keeps us safe. 
When they entered the temple, the Levites would sing Psalm 30, verse 1. I will praise you, Hashem, who has lifted me up. They would approach the priest and say, Deuteronomy 26, verse 3, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. In other words, they were declaring that God has kept his word and delivered them into the land he promised, the land of milk and honey. Yes, God has never broken a promise because it's impossible for him to break a promise. Moses instructed them on what to say when they appeared before the Lord in his temple. They were to speak in Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue. Deuteronomy 26, verse 5 through 11 is the text. However, it was changed from the original in the translation. What it originally said was, Our fathers were caused to perish in Syria, Aram, which was referring to Laban trying to curse Jacob so that he could steal Jacob's sheep to enlarge his own flock. Then he went down to Egypt, few in number, and we pick up the scripture there. And there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. Then you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you and your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. That, my friends, is a beautiful ceremony. This is what the enemy tries to do, however, thwart God's plans for God's people and cause them to be destroyed. We need to be thankful for God's protection from the evil one. When we stop bringing our first fruits before the Lord, our earnings, our time, and our praise, we become more self-centered. We begin to take pride in ourselves, which is idolizing ourselves and putting God second. In order to be thankful for our fortunes, we have to be mindful of our misfortunes. Whether blessings or curses, our God can take a curse and turn it into a blessing. And we have to be mindful of those times that God took a curse against us and turned it into a blessing. Deuteronomy 26, verse 13 through 15. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have I removed any of it for an unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Folks, that is absolutely beautiful. They were letting God know they held nothing back, but they have met their part of the covenant. Their first fruit offerings were given to the priests, the Levites, working in the temple, and the orphan, the widow, and the poor. In turn, Adonai is agreeing that because they have met the terms of the covenant, they are his own unique treasure. This is type and shadow of our being his bride. You see Deuteronomy 6 and 4, the Shema. Shema, hear, O Israel. It's not just something we say. It's me ha tikava, li babi ka or the hope, the heart of our being. Deuteronomy 26, verse 18 and 19. 
Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you, that you should keep all of his commandments and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made in praise, in name, and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. Boy, this thing is full of lessons. If we are obedient to the Torah, God will be our witness and lift us up in praise, reputation, and glory. We will be a Kodesh Kodeshim, holiness, a holy people. And this is what God meant when he said in Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And this is where 1 Peter 1.16 comes from. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Here God is clearly saying the key to being holy is obedience to the Torah. You know, the one the church has declared to be obsolete, but is not. And you know, when I was writing this, the presence of God filled the room. It was an unexpected visitation, and it was amazing. Rabbi Jason Sobel of Fusion Global said this, Disconnect Gentile roots from Jewish shoots, and you'll wind up with strange fruit. Now let's go to chapter 27. In chapter 27 of Deuteronomy, we find the story of Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. As you read this chapter, I hope this picture becomes vivid to you. You see, the entire nation of Israel was to be assembled and brought to these two mountains that are next to each other. The temple Levites are formed up at the bottom between these two mountains. And we see that Gerizim is lush and green, representing blessings, and Ebal is bald and without greenery, representing curses. Moses instructed them to set up 12 stones on Mount Ebal that had not been cut and set them up. And he said, put plaster on them and write all the words of the Torah upon them, not just in Hebrew, but in all 70 languages that existed on the earth at that time. The 70 languages part, of course, comes from non-biblical records. Then he instructed the six tribes, the ones seeing erring over time and committing adultery like Reuben committing adultery with his father's concubines and who didn't want to cross the Jordan River into the promised land but wanted to stay in Moab. He instructed these six, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Nephtali to be on Mount Ebal, while Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishakar, Joseph, and Benjamin were to stand on Mount Gerizim. God was taking the six on Mount Ebal to summer school because they had failed the curriculum in the desert. They were being taught by God to get back on track. Now both mountains, the twin peaks, were designated by God for the reading of his blessings and curses that Israel would occur for obeying or disobeying his law. Therefore the temple Levites in the valley below could hear all that was said. Deuteronomy eleven twenty six through 29. It records the Lord's words to Israel. He said, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. The curse if you disobey the commandments of the Lord your God. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings and on Mount Ebal the curses. 
Now we know that Moses was forbidden to go into the promised land. Therefore, after the battles of Jericho and Ai, it would be Joshua who led the people to the two mountains and read the law of Moses to them. Joshua chapter 8 verse 35. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. So, in the most simplistic way, God warned them with the blessings and curses. The curses, as you might have guessed, were read from Mount Ebal and the blessings from Mount Gerizim. Remember this, a curse is a loss of blessing. God does not punish arbitrarily. He does chastise his people because he loves them, but it's not at random. Hebrews 12 verse 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now as you read the curses in Deuteronomy 27 verses 15 through 26, just be aware that a lot of them are things that are done in secret behind closed doors, or when it is thought that no one is listening or sees you. Remember, the cause and effect of sin is to set the curse in motion. Obedience sets in motion the blessings of God. That's how God set up the universe. Numbers 32, verse 23. But if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. You see, in God's universe, there is no such thing as getting away with it, for all will be brought into accountability. Luke 8, verse 17. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Also note that the six tribes on Mount Ebal were to pronounce these curses, and after each one they were to say, Amen. Now, amen in Hebrew means to confirm. It's an oath. It means I accept the statement of terms. Let me give you just a couple of tidbits here. Deuteronomy 27, 18 says, Cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road. Now, this can also mean spiritual blindness. Many have lost their way simply because they are ignorant of the commandments. We are to help them to get back onto the path. Verse 19, cursed is the one who perverts the justice due the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. You see, anyone interfering with the mispot, justice, will bring a curse upon themselves. This is interfering with zadokah, righteousness. Justice and mercy will be perfectly balanced when Christ comes to rule and reign on the earth. Justice and mercy will should be in place in our lives when dealing with others right now. Obedience to God's rules brings us under his covering like a mother hen over her young. It's a life of protection, defense, and safety. And who doesn't want to be safe? Psalm 91 verse 4, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. 1 John 3, verse 4, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You can also substitute the word there, Torahlessness, but which is separation from God's protection, where cause and effect take over. People think that cause and effect are not there because sometimes it takes a while to catch up with them, but it always does. And this is why we warn continuously that the cause and effect of abortion will catch up to America. It's coming because we are still unrepentant and rebelling against God. Just think about this. There are around 60 million women in America that without teshuva, repentance, is suffering or will suffer mental illness, hurt, pain, anxiety, and another of other problems because of abortion. Think about all those fathers who either lost or did not want those children. Then just think about all of those who helped them get abortions and didn't stand for the word of God and tell them the consequences, which would include all those who voted for politicians 
who support abortion. So I say many more than 60 million people because the real number's not known because many have had more than one abortion. I've heard as high as three or four. We've been over the scriptures before, but killing a baby in the womb is not on God's blessing list. And you see their suffering because sin has an effect on a person's mind. Sometimes they bury it, but eventually it has to come out. Will these 60 million plus people, Teshuvah, repent and seek forgiveness? Isaiah 59 verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Folks, Anytime we have the occasion to minister to any of these people, just let them know that the God who made them loves them, and in him they can find forgiveness and restoration. But the time is now. Acts 17, verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. There are no secret sins. God knows everything about us, including the motives behind our words and our actions. Sin defiles, soils, and brings on spiritual death. Satan tempts us because he wants to destroy God's people. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 and 2, if you listen closely to what Adonai your God says, observing and obeying all of his mitzvot, that's commandments, which I am giving you today, Adonai your God will raise you high above all nations of the earth, and all the following blessings will be yours in abundance if you will do what Adonai your God says. So in verse 1, the word used for raise you high is Elyoen which is in the same root word family as Elohim. It means that he will lift you up and make you in his image. In verse 2, it says all the blessings that he is going to list goes to the obedient in abundance. Yeshua is taking this Torah portion to a new level. If we honor our side of the covenant, we will have life and life more abundantly. John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. There's the same word again. The word abundantly was transferred from the Hebrew word, which means these blessings will overtake you. God will change everything, including our thoughts, if we will but surrender to him. That is the biggest obstacle, our surrender to him completely. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Folks, read the blessings and the promises. Deuteronomy 28 verses 3 through 13. Deuteronomy 28, 11 through 15. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And then it goes on to list the curses. 
read them, and you'll begin to see that the curses are the opposite of the blessings you just read. Verse 16 is the opposite of verse 3, and verse 17 is the opposite of verse 5, and so forth. Deuteronomy 28, verses 21 through 25. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with the sword, with scorching, and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. All your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become troublesome to all the nations of the earth. So back in verse 7, folks, in the blessings, remember he said that our enemies would come one way and scatter seven ways from us. Now in the curses, that's reversed, and the disobedient will go down in defeat. As I read these curses, I could not help but wonder if we're seeing the future of an unrepentant America. Think about this. God says debt is slavery. If a nation is in obedience to the Torah, they will have an abundance and can lend to other nations and reap the benefits. Are we blessed to be a lender nation? No, we are cursed because we're a debtor nation. On a national level, America is enslaved to other nations. Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. America has become an example of a nation that was blessed and now cursed because of sin. America used to be a showcase of God's blessing, but now is a showcase of a national curse. God says, if you refuse to pay attention, the cause and effect of your sin will find you out, hunt you down, and destroy you. Remember, in Revelation, one-third of mankind will be destroyed at one time. Elijah prophesied against wicked King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's false union of the governmental system and the religious system of that time. That false system brought about three and a half years of drought with no rain. Today, the people of the church go along with the government's false system, which together with the false beliefs established through syncretism in the 300s AD, we have assemblies that have spots and wrinkles. Could there be a correlation between that false system of Ahab and Jezebel, three and a half years of drought, and the last three and a half years of the tribulation? There are many signs that correlate between the last part of chapter 28 and today's world. I'll list a few, but you can examine them all in your study. Verse 29, And you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. Today the elite in charge are groping around like the blind, lying about everything. They double the price of gas, and when it drops a few cents, they tell us we're doing great. We have inflation that's causing families pain, yet they tell us it's a sign of a healthy economy. They tell us to buy electric cars and then tell us we can't charge them up because their power grid can't handle the load. So many flat-out wrong decisions and lies are being made. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And Joel 1, verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Verse 31, Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Your donkey, which is your transportation, shall be violently taken away from before you and shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies and you shall have no one to rescue. It's saying the wicked will have their transportation and food stolen from them. Verse 32, 
You and your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no strength in your hand. Listen, America has been blessed, preserved as a place for the descendants of Israel to live for the past 250 years. This place hid the woman Israel in prophecy, but we will be given over to our enemies and no one will be able to help us. Verse 33, A nation whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labor, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continuously. Other nations that we are in debt to will take our resources for our debt. All that oil beneath our feet that our government will not allow to be used will be harvested by foreign nations, and there will be nothing we can do about it. Our fertile fields, the amber waves of grain, will be food for the foreigner to whom we are in debt, and we will watch in hunger as they transport it away. Verse 36, The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. God has allowed a president to be over us whose God is power and money, one like our forefathers would not have known. The idol for Christianity is a wooden cross, and for Islam it is the cobblestone. Wood and stone idols we have, but not obedience to the word of the Lord. Verse 41, You shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. Folks, there's so much distance between our young people today and common sense that it's staggering. They are spoiled, their minds cooked with drugs, without God and convinced that the government will take care of them and that socialism and communism, which deny God, is good. They refuse to believe history that these ideologies are dismal failures and full of oppression and misery. They don't work. The young people want it so they can use abortion for birth control and fill their brains with mind-altering drugs. Verses 58 and 59. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues and great and prolonged plagues and serious and prolonged sicknesses. God says to search your hearts about these things. America's hell bent on sin from the government to the assemblies of believers that go along with the principles of men rather than the principles of God. Verse 38 through 42, nothing we do will prosper. Verses 43 through 45. The alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. Then in verses 47 through 51, I'll sum it up. We will serve our enemies in hunger, thirst, and in nakedness with a yoke of iron around our neck until we are destroyed. A nation will come against us as swift as the eagle flies, one who speaks in a foreign tongue. Verse 52, those walls around the homes of the elite will be breached. Nancy, Chuck, Barack, Jerry, and all the rest of you who would not build a wall around our nation, an enemy will tear down the ones around your homes and strip away your ill-gotten wealth without mercy and leave you blind, naked, and groping. That enemy is the one you have been serving, the evil one. Verse 62, you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of of the Lord your God. Folks, these are harbingers from the Lord. Once the Lord rejoiced over our nation, now because of our unrepentant sin, the Lord will rejoice to destroy us as he did Israel. Our God is a loving God who wants to prosper, but we have shaken our fist in his face and denied his commandments. 
God does not do these things as we have explained before. In the ancient days, they saw that everything good and bad was attributed to God, but we now know that it is the cause and effect of our sin that brings us to destruction. God doesn't have to do anything. The universe is set up so that sin brings destruction and death. Inherent in the laws of the universe is the greater our obedience, the closer we get to God, and the more prosperity we have. God is waking up the DNA of Israel in these days. He is bidding all to return to the commands of the Torah. The Torah, the one true God, and acts of kindness are the world's foundation. Folks, the locusts have all but eaten away the constitution and the morality of our nation. We are on the path of ancient Israel to be destroyed. America's in a desperate state because we have ignored the morality of God, the commandments of God that are established and kept through our Lord Yeshua, who observed the Sabbath, the feast days, and the commandments of God, and admonished us to do so if we love him. John 14, verse 15, If you love me, he said, keep my commandments. Matthew 5, verse 17 through 20, Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. He's referring to the law of Moses, the Torah. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Folks, God will have the last word when Christ comes We'll be learning the principles of peace from the Prince of Peace during the millennium of peace in the city of peace. And all of God's children said, Amen. This is Pastor Frank Smith. Pay attention. Life in America is not as it seems. We are in the high holy days of God. Search your hearts. To he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the assemblies of believers. Our God wants to prosper you and do you good. He wants his protection to cover you like the wings of an eagle. Let him wake up the Israel DNA in you. It's there because he put it there in every human being, but we have to give it free reign. Our free will has to open the door to him. Do it and live. Let the evil have free reign and you will be destroyed. That is the lesson that God has put forth to us today. This day, he again takes us to Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. This day, he wants you to speak the blessings and the curses and then make your choice. Yeshua is waiting. Surrender yourself to him today and every day, the moment you arise from your sleep. Shalom. Shalom.